Genesis chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 4 through 17 this morning. Three major points we're going to look at here in these notes. But let's read the text in its entirety and go back and kind of make sense of what God has in store for us. Because it's not just this morning's topic uh, that's important in the, in the verses we're going to read, but we're going to see God's design for flourishing in our relationships when it comes to our work ethic, when it comes to our marriages, when it comes to our families, that God has designed all these arenas of living that we exist in to flourish. And not only for us to flourish, but to help others flourish as well. And so we look at Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth, when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord caused the, to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It flows around the whole land of Hevala, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good, and the Bedulam and the Onyx Stone are there. And the name of the second river is Gihon. It flows around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. What we need to understand is now the focus of Genesis becomes... That of us being aware of God's intentions for man. And by man, I mean men and women. He has set up the world for us to exist in, to live in, and to do more than just exist. To actually live for his glory and our good. And here in chapter 2, we see the beginning of, of God setting man on this course for good, for health, for benefit, for, for, for everything that man was designed to be and to be engaged in. What you're going to notice in your Bible, and if you have the Bible, uh, up to this point, God has just been known as God. 35 times, chapter 1 into chapter 2, just the name Elohim, Hebrew for God, has been mentioned. What we need to understand is that is the name for creator God, the God who is omnipotent, who is sovereign. But now in verse 4, a different name for God is used. And it's Yahweh. And what does Yahweh mean? It means God who is in relationship with his creation. So now the writer intentionally shifts our focus from understanding God as just creator and sovereign and omnipotent over everything that he's created, but now to a God who is intimately acquainted with his creation, specifically us as human beings. Are you grateful that God is a Yahweh God who is in covenant with his people, who is in relationship with his people. This is one of the most marvelous truths in all of scripture is that God is not some distant deity who could care less about you. God is a God who comes up close and personal and is intimately related with us. So when you see the phrase Lord God together in your Bibles, that is the term Yahweh, which means this is a covenant relational God who does care for you more than you will ever imagine. Amen? 
So the writer wants us to understand that now there's a shift in the narrative that tells us that God is this God who is going to relate with his people and ultimately redeem his people because he cares for us. Now what's really significant is in chapter 3 when Eve and the serpent are having their conversation about how good is God really the name for God changes just in that one moment. It's as if the devil wants Eve to know that God is not Yahweh God. He's not personally interested in your life. He's just creator God who really wants nothing to do with you. And so just in that one conversation is this idea of a personal relationship God pulled out once again because the serpent wants Eve to know God doesn't really care for you. And the serpent is still actively involved today whispering that lie in people's ears. That we wake up and we face the day and how many voices are we listening to that are influenced by the enemy who continues to tell us God doesn't care for you. We just recited a verse in Romans 8 that says if God is for us, who can be against us? And we need to be reminded that there's a God for us or else we could have just ended this whole book at, at Genesis chapter 3. Why is there all this other stuff here? Because this is the account of God's love for you. This is a reminder to you that Yahweh God cares for you. Not so much in that he just wants to relate with you, but he's gone so far to redeem you. Praise God for him being Yahweh and loving us. Amen? Those are bonus points for you this morning. I'm not going to charge you extra for that, all right? Point number one. We live in a world that is, there's a design to flourish. The design to flourish. So what we need to see is as this, this section starts, there's two things that are in focus. There's design of the world, and then there's design of humans, man. And I want to unpack that briefly because God is done creating. Six days of creation. First three days, he forms what he's created. And then the last six, the three days of the six days, he fills what he's created. And then he rests on the seventh day. Now, he has designed everything to flourish within the plants, within the trees, within the, within the animal kingdom. There is within all of this creation, this idea that it's going to reproduce and multiply. And so he has designed a world to flourish. But the problem comes, if you look at verse six, uh, 5 and 6, it says, um, now there's no shrub of the field yet, and there's no plant of the field that has yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. Now, this is an interesting point because God has set up the world to flourish, but man plays an important role in tending to that which is now untended. So there's something in the ground, there's something wired into what God has created that needs man to step in and cultivate it so that the flourishing can begin. It's interesting that God has set up this world to, to reproduce. The problem is, if you just let the world reproduce in, in its normal form and fashion, things get a little crazy. I mean, just come to my backyard sometime, even though my wife would not want you to come to our backyard. When you don't tend to things, things will just go ahead and grow at their own will. Does anyone have a yard like that right now? Let's just admit, yeah. We're all guilty. We're all sinners. Oh, you guys are just, yeah. So, we, we, we live in the desert. When you don't tend to things, there's these things called weeds that just sprout up. It's like, where did they come from? It's like the plant of the devil, right? These things pop up in rocks and they pop up near your houses and you don't have to do anything to them. They just appear, right? And a lot of people would say that, that actually weeds and thorns and thistles were a result of man's disobedience in chapter three. That's not a hill I'm gonna die on. All I know is in Genesis two, it tells us that things are gonna grow. Things are going to reproduce. Things are going to sprout. And God doesn't want things just to go crazy. He has created man to bring order. 
He has created man to bring this idea of, of I'm going to tend to the ground, I'm going to cultivate what God's growing, and I'm going to bring order to God's creation. And so we have this design of the world that everything's now in place, and now man is needed to rule it and subdue it. Which brings us to man, the design of man. So now notice, God puts man into the garden to cultivate the ground. Verse 7, then the Lord God formed man. So he's got this plan in his mind to put man into the world to bring rulership and, and order and to subdue it. Well, now he creates man. Now, what, what we have is not a second creation account because he's already created man in chapter 1. And there's so many liberal scholars out there that would tell you that the Bible's full of contradictions. Well, here's one of them, because now you have a creation account in Genesis 2 when you've already had one in chapter 1. Are these two contradictory creation accounts? No, because all chapter 2 is doing is now zeroing in in a much more detailed fashion on the creation of man. And what do you need to know about man? Two things here in Genesis 2 that are so wonderful and so special. Two things. Number one, God formed the material body of man. And I want you to write one word by that note. Dust. God formed the material body of man. And we'll talk about dust. And secondly, God breathed the immaterial soul. Write by that word, or write this word, glory. So what you need to see when it comes to God forming and breathing, when it comes to man's design, he is but dust, yet there's glory in this creation. So let's, let's talk about that. Verse 7. Then God formed man from the dust of the ground. So he formed man from the dust, and he breathed into the nostrils of man the breath of life, and man became a living being. So now, man is set apart from the animal world, right? Because the animal world is, is formed, but there's no spirit of God in the animals. This is what sets man apart. But man is also distinct from, from the angelic realm, angels, where they don't necessarily have a form or a body, but they're spiritual creatures. Man is set apart from both those things. This is why the psalmist in Psalm 8 says, man is the crowning achievement of your creation, the apex of what you have created, God. What is man that you should think so highly of him? And so you have man being formed from the dust of the ground. Now think about dust. And again, back to Arizona. We've got dust. I mean, how many of you have dusted something to come back a half hour later and it's this, this thick again? Dust is of little worth dust is something that we would just rather do away with and yet what the bible wants us to understand is that we need to understand our humble origins that you are created from the dirt of the ground that you only by the grace of god can aspire to glory but you and me and everyone is coming from such humble origins this this idea of forming is really the language of a potter with clay that the the potter takes this this element and begins to shape it and begins to form it and this is why the bible uses that analogy so frequently through its pages is that god is the potter you are the clay and what right do you have as the clay to say to the potter why do you make me like this so there's this idea of humble origins before a God who formed us from just this base element of the world. And lest you think this is just figurative language, chemical analysis of man's body has shown the validity of this statement. Let me talk about this. The human body is made up of the earth's constituent elements. Suppose we're going to go home and make a human body. Here are the supplies you will need to make the human body. You would need 58 pounds of oxygen. You would need 50 quarts of water. You would need two ounces of salt, three pounds of calcium, 24 pounds of carbon, some chlorine, some phosphorus, some iron, some sulfur, some glycerin. Go ahead and take it home in your fries, grocery bags. Put it all together. 
Those are the basic elements of who you are as a human being formed from the dust of the earth. Pretty amazing, isn't it? And yet, no matter how much or how well you mix it together, no scientist can create such complexity that is involved in who we are as human beings because there's more to it than just that. Take a mere piece of skin the size of a postage stamp. If you took a piece of skin the size of a postage stamp, you would require for that postage stamp of skin three million cells, a yard of blood vessels, four yards of nerves, 100 sweat glands, 15 oil glands, and 25 nerve endings. Now, how is your human body project going, at, going on at home? There's no Time Life how-to book on this. Man, though made from the dust of the earth, is incredibly complex in their physical form in our physical form. This is why we are nothing but dust, and yet there is glory set upon human beings, men and women. This is why the Bible says in verse 7 that God formed the man from the dust of the earth and then breathed life, the breath of life, into his nostrils and thus made him a living being. What sets you apart is the fact that God breathed life into you. And I want you to understand this word breathe. In your Bible or in your electronic device, make a note on the word breathe because this is the intimacy of a kiss-to-kiss, face-to-face relationship. The word breathe literally means God came up to man and literally kissed the face of man, and through that kiss brought an intimacy and a life that could not be found outside of God himself. Wonderfully relational, incredibly intimate, this idea that God would share his very life with man. The word for breath, is the same word used for spirit, and this is what sets man apart from any other aspect of creation. You alone have the spirit or breath of God within you. This is why when we sing that song, Great Are You, Lord, you know, it's your breath in my lungs. Literally, it is God's life-giving spirit that even allows us to be alert, to be aware, to be awake. And, and the Bible frequently talks about the spiritual nature of man being the essential part of who we are as men and women. You remove the spirit and we're no different than any other part of the animal kingdom. And yet, it is God who animates us. It is God who energizes us. It is God who awakens us. And it's, it's more than just physical animation. What he brings with his breath is this spiritual understanding and this awakened conscience. See, there are things that you cannot go home when you make your human body and put into the body you are designing. Because how do you create a conscience? How do you form conviction? How do you breathe in this awareness of truth that God has set eternity in the hearts of men and women? How do you produce this in the lab? It can only come from the very breath of God who now breathes and shares this with every single human being. Incredible that there's this moral capacity that is only granted by God's breath. And it is this very breath that produces life. And not just physical life, but spiritual life. Think about how Paul refers to this very moment in 1 Corinthians 15. Write these verses down. We're going to look at them on the screen. He says, is there a way we can move that down a little bit? Oh, it's better over here. We'll go to this side. You're the favored side this morning, all right? Thus it is written. Now notice Paul, in chapter 15 of Corinthians, is talking about the resurrection of Christ and our future resurrection for those of us that love Jesus ourselves. Thus it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Who is the first Adam? The one we're talking about this morning. Who is the last Adam? 
Jesus. So for the first Adam became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural. And then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. But the second man is from heaven, uncreated, right? As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Is that cool? How Paul, some 3,000 years later, says this is significant because we know what happens in the next chapter of Genesis. We diminish the glory that is ours by creation because of disobedience and sin. And because God is a Yahweh God who loves us and wants us to flourish, he says, I will send a rescuer, capital R, whose name is Jesus Christ, who is not born of the dust like you and I are. He is uncreated in the sense he is eternal. He is the one that now gives us hope and satisfaction, and contentment, and breathes within us a joy that is undescribable because God could have left us to go to the dust. But yet, He has designed us to spend eternity with Him. Thus, the importance of Jesus Christ. Amen? So here we have this incredible idea of man in his humble origins, dust. And yet, the glory that is bestowed upon man because of the fact that he's created in the image of God. The psalmist talks about frequently in the Psalms the idea that if God removed his breath, we would but be but dust and return to the earth. Job talks about if God would just go ahead and remove his breath, we would be nothing but dust at the end of the day. And so this is literally important stuff to understand that is used throughout Scripture in this idea that God has designed us not only to live in humility, because we're dust, but to recognize your glory as one who is created in his image. Amen? So it's important to understand. Number two, the capacity to flourish. So not only is there this design to flourish, but you have been created with the capacity to flourish. And we need to talk about two things. Number one, our location. And number two, our vocation. So check this out. Here is the earth created, and yet it is untended. It needs man to step in to cultivate it. So God creates man for this purpose of cultivating the untended world. There's this garden. It's not necessarily the the Garden of Eden. It's somewhere located near Eden. And yet, from the author's perspective, it is this land that is lush. It is ripe for, for life and activity. And we come to verse 8 and it says that the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden. And there he placed man whom he had formed. Notice right there, God deliberately placed man in a specific location to do a specific task. And what you need to know is that there are never accidents when it comes to God's plan. And what we need to understand is that your capacity to flourish has nothing to do with your circumstances. How many of us have fought against God because we just don't like where we're at right now? I mean, let's just be honest. How many of us just resist and fight God because we're like, God, I don't like my home. I don't like my neighborhood. I don't like my job. I don't like where my kids go to school. I don't know. I like where I go shop for my groceries, blah, 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 blah. And yet God at this very day says to you, you're exactly where I want you. Think about this right now. You are in the place where God wants you because God is sovereign and he's going to direct your steps but you're exactly where God has planned for you to be. And what we must learn in our humble, dust-like state is that he has placed me here for a reason. And how many of us just want to quickly jump out of those crucibles that we're in that we just don't like to be in? Those places where we're feeling the heat, we're feeling the pressure, there's some anxiety, there's some stress, there's uncertainty, whatever you want to call it. And we have to realize that God, I want to accept the fact that right here, right now, 
I understand you're in control, and I may not understand why you have me, where you have me, but I am here for some reason to flourish and to help others flourish, help me see what I'm not seeing. This is a hard concept to accept because we're always thinking about where we would rather be who we'd rather be with, the other job that I would really like. And all those things are, most of the time, are seeds of dissatisfaction and discontentment that are sown in by the enemy because he doesn't want you to take great delight and pleasure in where God is today in your life and where he has you. I'm not saying you can't pray about your future and say, I would really like to have another vocation. I'm not saying that, you know what, you, you can't move from your house. You've got to stay there forever, whether you like your neighbors or not. I've got a guy behind me who sings the most awful karaoke at midnight. And you know what, I just sit there and go, you know, dude, come to Sozo. We've got an open mic night. Get, get your vocals out there. Not outside the backyard where you cannot sing Kenny Chesney worth a darn. You know what I'm saying? But you know what, I, don't, I love, you know, but, but the idea is right here, right now. You have today. You, 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 you can't redo tomorrow, unfortunately. And you're not guaranteed, to, you can't redo yesterday and you don't have tomorrow. You've got right now. And so your question is not this, God, get me out of this location. Your, your question to God is, show me, God, how I can flourish and help others flourish right here, right now. Man is placed in the garden and God doesn't ask him, where would you like to go, Adam? Is there another location that, that you would like to be? He is merely placed in an environment that God has purposed for him and he remains there. So your location is important in understanding why God has you there. Which brings us to our second point and it's going to tie in with the first. Your vocation. Can I just, here's a little mini sermon within a sermon. Let's talk about work. You realize work is, for the, for the average person, if you have a 50-year career, the average person spends 100,000 hours working. 25% of your lives is devoted to a job. And yet, within Christian circles, evangelical circles, we don't talk about what does a theology of work look like. And I'm going to tell you, right now that there are two improper motivations when it comes to work one is money and one is status if your objective is to make more money or make a name for yourself you will be miserable in whatever vocation you embrace money is too unimportant and as you get older, you realize this. If your pursuit of money is your main objective, it is going to be too unimportant, and you will realize this, and I hope you will realize this sooner than later. Because there's a lot of men and women who pursue money, and they end up bankrupting everything else that is important in their lives, namely their relationship with God and relationship with other people. And or if your pursuit is identity or status, I'm going to tell you this is too important to lean on a job for your identity or your status. Because if you're not doing well, you'll feel like you're a nobody. Because so much of who you are is wired into your vocation and God has not designed vocation to feed your identity. This is like when men lose their jobs because God has designed them intrinsically with this, this warrior fighter uh, journey, you know, uh, uh, identity within them and they lose the job and now they're wounded. They don't know how to deal with the inner person of who they are because so much of who they were was tied into what they did. This is why when men get together, oftentimes the number one question is, so what do you do? As if what I do is the most important thing about me. Versus, who are you? 
Now, you want to disrupt a room full of macho dudes, you ask that question. <laughs> Who are you? Hey, nice to meet you, Kevin. Who are you? <laughs> well, I'm not used to being asked that question. Why? Because we've bought into this lie that our jobs are, number one, to be pursued because of the money we make, or number two, the status or identity we can get from it. Let me, let me just talk to you real quick about work, because work is a part of God's perfect provision in paradise. Work is a part of God's original purpose for life. So many people would say, well, work is a result of, of the fall, of sin, Genesis 3. No, it's not. Man was designed to cultivate, i.e. work, the ground that needed to be tended to. Work is intrinsically part of who we are, so we need to consider work as important, but we need to consider what is important work. So I want you to take some little notes down in, in, your, in, your, in your notes. True work ought to be a partnership or cooperation with God. There's a psalm in Psalm 127, verse 1, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. What the psalmist is keying us in on is this partnership in order for us to flourish and help others flourish, there's got to be a cooperative work with God in what we put our hands to. Now notice, I said nothing about salary in that whole explanation there. Because work can be important even if you don't get paid for it. And sometimes the most important work, it's, it's going to be kingdom of God work. That's the most important work. Sometimes you don't get paid for it. This side of eternity. To realize that we have all been wired to work. We've been given skills. We've been given capabilities to do something with. Jesus uses frequent illustrations about this. And to realize that we will stand before God one day. And it doesn't matter how much was in our bank account. How much benefits we got from our job. What matters is how well did we live, leverage our abilities for the kingdom of God. The most important work is your cooperative relationship with God in advancing the kingdom because that's the only kingdom that's going to last forever. Now, is earthly work not important? Is your job at your school, at your corporation not important? I'm not saying that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you right now that perhaps your job is more important than my job. Now, I'm going to tell you, I love my job. I love being a pastor. And I love the, the look I get in people's eyes. And they're like, tell me about that. What does that mean? Like, no, I don't only work on Sundays for an hour and a half. That's not what my job consists of, right? I love being a pastor, but I love being a pastor to those that are working in the world where you need to be influencers for Christ. And this is why when it comes to work, the Bible does not speak of bifurcating that which is sacred between that and that which is secular. Because you're thinking to yourself, how can I bring a spiritual component to my job? Well, you can in a variety of ways. I'm going to tell you how to do that. Because your job as a janitor at the elementary school where my kids go to is as important as my job as a pastor. And some of you are like, oh, What? How can that be? The, the man who is the president of Microsoft is no more important than the guy who's fixing your car at the local Big O. The Bible does not speak of this division between secular and sacred. The Bible says there's this thing called the priesthood of all believers, and you're all priests in the house of God. You're all pastors in the world that God has created. Now you go forth with the best kingdom ethic to advance the thing that is ultimately important, that is the love of Jesus. Your job in influencing people for Christ is more important than my job. I mean, I used to be at a church, and I had a church office, and I met with church people, and I dealt with church drama, and I dealt with church this, church this. You don't want that. So many people come to me and say, if I only got a job at a Christian company, I said, no, stay away. This is not a good thing. I mean, we're going to spend eternity together, right? But let's, there's a world out there that is desperate for Jesus, 
And if you understand your position at Intel, your position at, at Microchip, or your position at Sozo Coffee, go Sozo! Your position at Circle K, your position at Lowe's, wherever you may be, what you need to understand is flourishing happens when you realize that you're not this, ju- this, just there for a paycheck. Five things. Bonus points and notes this morning. Five things you need to consider when it comes to your work for God, no matter what you're working in or no matter where you're working at. Number one, be excellent. How can you flourish and help others flourish? Don't do a half ass job. Amen? There's so many people who call themselves Christians and the work they do is so shoddy. I'm sitting there going, I'm embarrassed. So many people are like, oh, pastor, you need your car repaired on? Well, I've got this great Christian mechan- mechanic, right? You know, he's the guy with the advertisement in the, in the, and it's, there's a little Christian fish there and you're like, oh, I got to go to them and they do horrible work. I'm going to take my car to the best mechanic, whether he's a believer or not. Amen. But if you put a Christian fish by your ad, if you call yourself a Christian businessman, businesswoman, you better be the best in whatever vocation you are doing. Be excellent. Because your job shows the excellence and greatness of God. Amen? That's why here at at Sozo Coffee, you know what? If If you pull up our Yelp reviews or our Facebook reviews or our Google reviews, we're 4.5 and higher. 4.7. Can we get 4.8? Anyone? 4.8. Come on. Now, here's the thing. You want to know why? Because we've got great staff. Esther, Jorgen, Ryan, Garrett, Ian, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Did I catch everyone that's here? Because those that are, yeah, okay. And not only that, but we serve a great product. And we create a great environment. And I praise God for that because people still walk into these doors every week and they say, there is something different about this place. And that something different is the greatness and excellence of God. Right? Because the moment we start serving shoddy coffee, we're going to close those doors. Because God does not like shoddy coffee. Amen? Listen to me. If you're going to do a job... Be the best at your job. Believers in Christ should be the ones advancing and excelling in their workplaces, not because of the almighty dollar or the status or the identity or the title. They are doing it because they serve an excellent God. Do your work heartily as unto the Lord, for Jesus is your ultimate boss. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. There's no undercover boss with Jesus. He's, he's fully disclosed. And if you call yourself a believer, be excellent. Number two, show integrity. Because integrity has to do with the holiness of God. His character and his holiness is now shared with you as his child. And if you call yourself a Christian, you better be above reproach and have integrity and character because there's a lot of businesses out there where people don't have these things. Be different. Amen? So be excellent. Have integrity. Number three, show love to the people at your workplaces because God is love. And you know what? I could care less about the annoying guy in the cubicle next to you. He needs Jesus. And I could care less how someone is treating you when it comes to customer service on the other end of the phone. Love them and be Jesus to them. Okay? You claim to have the love of God. Show that love even to people who are obstinate, who are ornery, who are curmungeons, who just really get under your skin, who are just the people that are irritating and annoying. You know who I'm talking about. You're visualizing five people in your mind right now. You love them. Because your ethic at work is one of love. No matter where you are, you show love. Three. Burger King, amen. Go Whoppers. Oh, what is it? Bergens. Oh, I don't watch that stuff, Cheryl. I love Jesus, but you know. 
Can't stop the feeling. Is that that? Oh my gosh. I need some spiritual Drano for my mind right now. <laughs> Number four, spend wisely. You have a job, you are earning mon money, and your stewardship of that money reflects upon how much you value God and His kingdom. You don't get increases to increase your standard of living. You get increases to increase your standard of giving. You are given money and God wants you to provide for your family, but he also wants you to realize that when he gives you more, your first question is, God, how do you want me to steward this for your glory, your kingdom, your purposes? And how you spend money is going to show where your, where your heart is. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. And when people at work go, you just got a raise, what are you going to do? You know, your first thought should be, how can I invest this in the kingdom of God and his purposes? And number five, there's a verbal testimony you give when you go to work every single day. Quit complaining. Quit grumbling. People will see or not see the love of Christ in your life. And you know, we grumble and we complain because we're deeply dissatisfied and discontented and that has nothing to do with your circumstances. It has, with you, has, with, has everything to do with you not understanding how much God loves you in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Philippians 2 says, grumbling and complaining is a sin. And the person that's going to grumble in this job, they'll leave that job, they'll go to the next job, and guess what? They're going to keep grumbling. Because it has nothing to do with your circumstances, it has nothing to do with your position, it has nothing to do with the people you work with, it has to do with the fact that your heart is not seeking soul satisfaction in Jesus. There's theology of work 101. You like that? Good stuff there? I don't care if you guys don't like it, alright? So, <laughs> I, I love you. Honestly, I do. But honestly, you need to have the best reputation out there. When people think of Jared and Norm and Paola and Becky and John and Lori and Cheryl and Adam, they need to think, boy, those people have an incredible work ethic. That they, are, that they are not only flourishing in their own lives, they're helping others flourish by what they do. And that is God's design of work, that we live in a world where we are able to benefit one another and impact one another's lives. This is part of God's original creation plan. This is why work has to be more than just money and status. Amen? So you've been, had this capacity to flourish. Last point is this, the responsibility to flourish. How are we doing on time? All right, good. I'll take 20. No, I'll take 10. The responsibility to flourish. So we have this design... Right? We see in Genesis 2, creation and then man placed to tend to what God has created, cultivate, rule it, subdue it. We have this capacity. You've been hardwired. Now look at verse 15, just to kind of close out this point, enter, enter the next one. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden and said, cultivate it and keep it. Be the gardener and guard it. Preserve it, protect it. This idea that we have instructions to, to protect it because this stuff is able to go haywire. And we're called to kind of rope it in, harness it in, and, and channel it in a way that brings prosperity. Verse 16. And God said to man, commanded, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you shall eat from it and you will surely eat die. Two things. Number one, there's a provision that's given. There's the provision that there's a way of life. Eat from any tree of the garden. But with it, there's a prohibition that there is a way of death and there is one tree set up in the middle of the garden that you are to stay away from. Now, it's interesting that God has set up creation like this in Genesis 2. And we're going to talk about this over the next few weeks because God, with his provision, had to also put in a prohibition. Because God had created man as a free moral agent, but that free moral agent 
is not to be morally autonomous. Moral autonomy is deadly. Moral accountability is life-giving. So what is the provision? I mean, consider what God has set up for Adam. Look, Adam. Look at all the trees. Look at all the fruit. Look at the rivers that are flowing all over the place. There's this mist coming up from the ground. This world is primed and ready to go for vegetation to spring forth, for fruit to bust forth. And guess what, Adam? You have free reign of it all. And you can just imagine, he's like a kid in a candy store, right? Like he's looking all around going, this is awesome. And God says, you can eat from any tree that you want. But there's one tree out of 10,000 trees. There's one tree out of 10 million trees. I don't, there's one tree. Adam, the one tree. Do not touch. I mean, how many of us, right, l the little rebellious punks we are inside, <gasps> wet paint sign? Well, I'm just going to go ahead and touch it, right? There's a sign that says, don't touch it, wet paint. And we're just like, you know, hot stove, kids stay away. What? Ah, you know, as you raise children, as you have been raised, as a, we are raising kids, it's amazing. You want to give your kids so much freedom, so much liberty. But when it comes to life, there are prohibitions because you're saying, I want what's best for you. There's a whole world of wonderful things out there. Just stay away from the things that are going to hurt you and destroy you. Because when you do the things that I'm prohibiting to you to do, you're going to suffer the consequences. Now the question is, why did God have to set this up at the very beginning of what he's created? Because he had to provide an objective point where man could morally choose to disregard God. In order to be a free moral agent and have a perfectly free will, you have to not only be able to obey and love God to the utmost, you also have to love or hate God or despise Him to the utmost. Because God has not created robots, mechanical automons, who are just wired to do everything He wants us to do and can never do anything contrary to what He wants him to, us to do. There's no relationship there. Right? I'm not marrying a woman who has no free will that, you know, every day I get to pull the string out of her back and she gets to say, I love you, Scott. Like, what kind of relationship is there in that? I want to have a relationship where I realize that there are free choices involved and sometimes those choices can go against what you want. So God sets up man with this ability of free moral choice. Now, I want you to really consider this as we, as we close this section out. Because here's what God has commanded. Let me just tell you right now, God always sets the terms of engagement. <laughs> Can we just be big, big boys and big girls right now this morning? God defines the rules. He doesn't care if you like them. You may balk against them. You may criticize them. You may be frustrated with them. But think of the scene that's being created right here in front of our eyes. God is saying in prohibiting the eating of this one tree out of a million trees, I have given you life. I have given you a world full of pleasure. I have given you pleasures of taste and sight and sound and smell and feel and nourishment. Only one tree is forbidden to you. And the point of that prohibition is to preserve the pleasures of the world because if you eat of that one tree, you're literally saying to me, I am smarter than you. I am more authoritative than you. I am wiser than you are. I can think for myself better than you can care for me. And you're not a very good father at all. And so I'm going to reject you. So don't eat from the tree because when you do, you're essentially saying to me that all my good gifts and all my wisdom and all my care means nothing. So instead, the provision 
keep submitting to my will, keep affirming my wisdom, keep being thankful for my generosity, keep trusting me as father, keep on eating the trees that I have said are going to lead to life. There are 10,000 trees, every imaginable fruit. Go and eat, be thankful, because I've given them to you as an expression of my goodness, and I want you to savor them that way. These things are consistent with my character, and with my character, there is life. I define what is good and what is evil, because only God can objectively define what is good and what is evil. The moment we eat of the forbidden fruit and the tree that's prohibited, we then think we know what good and evil is. We live in a world where there's 7 billion people that are skewed when it comes to good and evil. And yet there's one who is only able to objectively define what is good and evil, and his name is God. And he says, don't eat from the prohibited tree. We celebrate the chairman of the board, Frank Sinatra, that he did it his way. And we sing that song at the top of our lungs as if it's a song of liberation. I did it my way, and it is a death song. Anytime we seek wisdom apart from the word of God, it will always lead to death. Can I say that again? Anytime we seek wisdom, the knowledge of good and evil, that's wisdom, apart from what God has prescribed, his word, his will, it will lead to death. Adam and Eve desired wisdom, but they sought it outside the word and will of God. They sidestepped God in his word and will and they wanted to become wise and yet their independence ultimately left them empty and unsatisfied. God dependence is the only way to life and fullness of joy. Saw a fantastic movie with my, my, my date on Friday, i.e. my wife. Um, a Quiet Place, who saw it? The, the, the horror movie where you, you have to be silent, right? Really good, really scary. It's PG-13. There's really nothing offensive in it. Few, few jump scares, a little bit of blood. But here, here's what's amazing about this movie. There are so many wonderful biblical themes in this movie. One is you live in a world where there has to be rules. If not, you suffer the consequences. This family is trying to survive with these alien creatures who are blind, but they have this incredible enhanced sense of hearing. And they have to live their lives in total silence. And if you don't obey the rules, and the dad has marked out the rules for his family, you will pay the price. And I sit there and go, how does our world, our world receive that message? Because it's a message that's coming forth loud and clear that there are things you do that will lead to life and there are things we do that will lead to death. And this is an important theme throughout scripture. Obedience equals blessing, disobedience equals cursing. I mean, this is through the word of God. And we have to realize that what we do with the word of God means everything. And this is why Matthew 4, 4, don't miss the words of Christ. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. How do we live? By feeding upon every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Stop and consider what God has given you. He has given you all you need for life and godliness. We live in a world where there are pleasures and satisfactions that abound 
that are not connected to God, that promise you everything up front, but when you eat of them, they will leave you destitute and empty. Why? Is God not enough? Is his word not enough? Is his will not enough? I mean, if I think about it, it's like going to the Grand Canyon and complaining that the toilet paper in the porta potty is one ply and not two ply. There is a world of splendor before you and all you can focus on is what you're not satisfied in. You have your health and you ought to thank God every day for your health, but the moment that mosquito bites you, that's all you can focus on. What is this compared to the greater glories that God has shared with you? We live in Arizona. Things are getting hot. If this is not your first radio, you should know these things. And yet we live in a world that is so clean and so healthy and so wonderful. We can go out hiking. We can, and the moment it hits 90, we start complaining. Guess what? There are people getting two feet of snow today. Who, thank, who thanks God for 90 degree weather right now? Amen. See how easy it is for us to, to go to that place where we are just dissatisfied and discontent. And God says, I am enough. My word is enough. My will is enough. I have set you up for success, not failure. Please enjoy all that I have given you because the moment you depart from my word and my will, you are going to end up in a death pursuit. This is why God sets up these provisions for us and sets forth prohibitions. So can I just tell you two things this week? This is your homework. You ready? Meditate on the glory of Christ. <laughs> Meditate on who you have as a Lord and a Savior and realize that He is good. Meditate on the glory of Christ that in Him you have life, in Him you have hope, in Him you have joy, and in Him you have everything. And realize that you are the vine and He is the vine and you're the branches and when you abide in Him, you've got more than you'd ever, ever dream of. Apart from him, you can do nothing. Apart from him, you have nothing. Apart from him, you're empty. Just meditate on the glory of Christ, please, this week. And number two, just be thankful for everything. Paul says, give thanks always and for everything. This means for the forgiveness of, of sins as well as your flannel bed sheets. This means for the, the hope of heaven as well as the fact that you get a second scoop of ice cream in your bowl. As you pray, as you talk, as you discuss, always make sure that there is a spirit of thankfulness in you. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? He has designed us to flourish and he wants us to be thankful in the flourishing he's provided, namely the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. Guys, I love you. Thanks for letting me yell at you for about 45 minutes. Let's stand, let's pray. This is going to be continued too because there's themes coming up. Marriage, husbands, wives, families, obedience, disobedience, sin. I mean, so many good truths that I'm looking forward to diving in with you in the coming weeks. So thank you for your prayers for me. I am praying for you. Lord, thanks for this morning, this special time that you have notched out for your people to come together, to be uh, unified, to be harmonious, no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, no matter our skin color, no matter our job, our vocation, no matter the color of our hair, no matter our, our marital status, we are here because of one person and his name is Jesus. This fellowship is sweet and it is good when brothers and sisters are able to dwell together, to look at your word, to sing your praises. Lord, there's so much to be thankful for. Thank you for giving us this time. Instruct our hearts and guide our path. May we live for your glory and experience the good you have in store for us in Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face towards you and give you grace and peace.
forever and ever. God bless you guys. Have a great day. See you soon.